is Zach Yacoub from How to Get a Job in Sports.com, and I'm here with Ben Standig, writer for The Athletic. Thank you so much for being here with me today. How are you? Zach, I'm good. How about yourself? I'm doing great. So you went to UMD, Baltimore County. What did you major in, and what did you learn that you still use today? Oh, wow. That was 100 years ago. I, <laughs> I majored in sociology. I never did anything professionally with it, but actually, it's a, especially now in this current time, it's, inter it's an interesting sort of background to have but I also minored in journalism and initially when I got out of college that is what I kind of leaned towards did some freelancing some internships but life went a different way I worked for some Wall Street firms for a bit but then 15 years ago I sort of found my way back towards journalism and that let me back it led me to kind of where we are now that's great so in high school and in college were you involved you know in writing for the school paper covering the athletics in college, I wrote for the school paper. I, I covered the UMBC, well, the UMBC basketball team before anybody knew they had a basketball team, well, well before the final, uh, before the NCAA tournament uh, fun. Did that and, you know, some other, you know, some other uh, sports on campus. Um, I was always more into professional sports and, and some college. Like, I, I didn't do too much high school stuff, but, uh, but I did that. And, and then I did a few things like um, the, the local papers in Montgomery County. Um, but then nothing for years until I, I sort of stumbled back into this. So when you were a kid, you were interested in journalism. What did you want to be when you grew up? I don't, I don't even know how to answer that now. But, uh, I mean, sports has just always been something I've been into. But not just like, hey, I want my team to win or lose, but why, are, why do things work the way they do? Like, I, I think I always wanted to be almost like a general manager more than I ever did. Like, I mean, I obviously want to be a player, but, like, I, I kind of figured out early on that that wasn't going to happen. So a general manager, uh, I was like viewing the game from that perspective. So, you know, thinking of trades, what, you know, the mock drafts, things like that. Um, so that, I think that, and then later on sort of the idea of, well, if I cover sports, that that's a way to be involved with it. Uh, you know, that started to become appealing. That's great. So in 2007, you became a podcast writer and host for FF Toolbox, which is a fantasy football site. You know, what made you want to get into that? I was, uh, <laughs> I had been working, so it was around this time, I forget the exact year or day, but whenever the mortgage crisis happened in this country, I was working for a mortgage firm mm -hmm. and uh, we all got laid off. And I was at, at that point doing some light freelancing and a friend of a friend was helping out FF Toolbox in some sort of like marketing kind of way. And he recommended to, they were looking for some writers. They rec recommended me. And that was a fun way to just sort of get, okay, like, let, let's, you know, I was into fantasy football more than, than the idea of doing a podcast. It was like amazing. I love the podcast. I still do when I, when I have one. And that it really was one small step, you know, one, one foot in front of the other for years and years of one little thing, another little thing, another little thing. And then eventually it got to the point where, um, you know, we're, 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 you know, I strung enough things together that got me to, uh, you know, to, to where I am now, basically. So when you were on that podcast, what were you talking about? Fantasy football tips, tricks, player analysis, stuff like that? I mean, that one definitely was all about fantasy football. You know, who to start, who to sit, you know, what, what, what this guy got hurt. What does that mean? You know, all that type of stuff. But probably the podcast to, uh, move forward a little bit. The one that I did, I liked the best was the, the, I've covered the Wizards for a lot of years, the Washington Wizards, and uh, I did a podcast that's like called Locked on Locked on Wizards. It's called Locked on Sports. They have a lot of uh, podcasts now, and basically there were no, you know, it was it was very early on in the podcast realm, and the Wizards, not the most popular team, there was no podcast. So I did that, and that was to me so much fun. Uh, really got to express. Um, you know, express myself, thoughts on the team, but I also got to use that as a vehicle to talk to uh, Michael Wilbon, David Aldrich, who is now my boss, but back then was you know, the, the guy on, on TNT, uh, talk to players, things like that. And it was just, it, for me, it was like probably the most fun I've had uh, in anything I've done. I just love the, the podcast platform. That's great. So you're talking about loving the, the, plot, the podcast platform. What about, you know, having a podcast interest you, you know, interviewing players, what else? Well, I, I just think ultimately 
talking things out for me sometimes it's a little bit easier to express what I want to say than writing it. I like having the conversation with people and um, you know, I think the, the podcasts I gravitate towards are the ones where I don't want to let, say claim that I am smart, but like an intellectual in, in, smart conversation about these things. I'm not hot takey, I'm not into, you know, oh, that guy sucks or whatever. Like I'm trying to like understand what is really happening here. It isn't just your team lost, therefore fire everybody. Like what actually happened? Yes, that trade doesn't look good in hindsight, but what, well, let's go back. What happened in that moment? What was the what was on the ground at that time? I remember um, on the Locked on Wizards thing, I did a, this was, 2016 17 so the year that the wizards won 49 games but they started off slow in the beginning of that year i did like a five or six part series with michael lee who's now my colleague at the athletic but he was with i think the post the washington post at the time on all things Ernie grunfeld we went through like all these trades you know drafting jan vesely and gilbert arenas and all these different things to sort of state like look I understand what the narrative is now about these things, but let's go back. Here's what actually happened in that in that year, in that time, why this trade would happen or why they did the signing or whatever. And I think it was, a, I really liked it because I thought it was, a, a, you know, it's, it's easy to simply say, well, that was stupid. Or was it stupid at the moment? Or was there a rationale to it? Sometimes things don't work out, even if it was the right thing to do, if that makes sense. So I've always tried to kind of approach it like that. And that was a particular series that really kind of, I thought worked that well for that. That's great. So going back to your experience, uh, in 2010, you started working with NBC Washington. You had a great time with them. You know, what roles have you had there? Well, you, you know my resume better than I do. Um, <laughs> I, um, so when I was doing some of these freelance things, I had started doing some stuff for the Associated Press, but that's sort of, that's not, that's just like covering a, a random game. There's no real opinion there. or It's not, it's not you. It's just you're sort of a faceless blah blob uh, just writing something um, I reached out to NBC Sports Washington it was around the time that LeBron was making the decision I remember and uh, I was just like eh, they just, it, it, that that website was always much more about uh, the steps the ugly stepchild to the to the television that that's what they care about but the website you know they needed to have one so I, I pitched an idea to write something and they were like sure and I just kind of kept showing up and eventually that led to more and more and I did freelance basically for them for almost a decade until there's a couple steps in between, but they eventually hired me uh, before I came to the athletic full time to, to cover the wizards and do some, uh, some NFL mock drafts and things like that. And uh, then I joined the athletic after that, but um, yeah, that was a, that was a really interesting experience to, to be a part of a, a, a television studio in particular will see the back end of how all that works, the different types of people that you have to, that um, they're needed to put on a TV show, but also from the website all, all, as well, you know, what, what are you looking to do? And, you know, you, you uh, whatever you can experience, especially if you can really get in there, you know, it, it, it all helps in the long run for sure. That's great. So what would you say the difference is in writing about, you know, the different sports, you know, basketball, football, What's the difference? Well, I mean, I think on the day-to-day -day level, it's all relatively the same. You're, you're trying to figure out who these people are, the players, the coaches, and, and so on. What makes, you know, what makes them tick? Why, are, you know, why is the team winning, losing? What, whatever the thing might be. The games are a little bit different. We're, we're in an era now where nobody really likes um, game stories. Uh, yeah, well, it's so funny to say that. I, we, I, any of us would kill to write a game story now because then that would mean there was an actual game. <laughs> but, uh, but like, you know, everybody's watching the game. They're, they're paying attention on Twitter. You don't really need the tell me why something happens because you're watching it. But it's more about sort of some in-depth things. And and, and one uh, basketball for me is a little bit easier to figure out what's happening in the moment. There's only ten guys on the court. You can see everything in front of you. You just watch the ball, and by and large, you kind of figure it out. Football, as we all know, like when you when you're watching on television, you're watching. The offense, of the line of scrimmage, and then you're watching the quarterback, but we don't see what's going on 40 yards down the field. And but realistically, we're not watching the offensive line. There's so many things happening that yes, even when they show replay, it's sometimes hard to figure out what's happening. So I think basketball in the moment is a little bit easier to digest. Football is a little more complicated. That's why people go back and watch the tape the next day to really see um, how it unfolded. But ultimately, it is just talking to people. And I mean, each sport has their own personality. 
um, in terms of what type of people are in it. But uh, but but yeah, I, I think it's, for me the probably the biggest difference is just watching a game. It's a little bit easier to digest basketball in the, on the fly than football. That's great. So for a big chunk of your career, you know, you covered multiple teams at once. But when you got your job with Scout Media, you were in charge of just the Redskins. What was it like to, you know, just be able to focus on one team? Well, it's funny. Uh, the, the answer to that is that was not – that wasn't the case because ultimately what I was doing was I was still doing other freelance jobs. I mean, I you had to pay the bills, and that was a, it wasn't a full-time job. That was just part of a freelance thing. So – I did that. I, I, I did that. That, that. What was interesting about that job in particular was the Redskins page was mine. I got to do with it uh, essentially as I wanted and I could bring people in to help me and, and uh, you know, come up with all that and, and color schemes and pictures and the Breaking Burgundy name was my idea and, and things like that. And that got me in the door the first time sort of at Redskins Park because, you know, uh, Scout Media was, you know, a legitimate site and, and it's, it is viewed differently than like a fan blog type thing so um that got me in the door at redskins park for the first time i'd already been doing wizards and some other things um but uh but i, I that said i used to always say to myself what i wonder what i could do if i could only cover one team because there were i mean i i i, I don't want to say this in the wrong way like i sort of famously was a guy who was at every event in town i mean i was covering there, there would be days i'd be covering or be writing about three or four different teams in any given day um, I, there was one year I think I spent close to like 100, uh, 200 days, 180 days at Capital One Arena between covering the Wizards, Red uh, Wizards, Georgetown, and the Mystics, <laughs> or something like that. Um, so now I finally sort of get to get to feel that whole thing about what it would be like to just cover one team, and um, it's uh, it's all right. <laughs> I don't mind. I, I I don't mind the amount. I think I'm getting. Uh, I'm getting a little too old to, have to, to be pulled in 27 directions. And at some point, you have to be able to focus. And if you want to compete, you know, your colleagues, for the most part, especially on the Redskins beat, they're not covering eight of the teams. Um, I mean, I still, do, I still do dabble in some of the Wizards and Georgetown and, and, and so on, but, but, but not nearly as much as I used to. You talked about going to all these games, you know, at Capital One Arena. When you go to a game and you, and you watch it, what are you looking for? What, what type of storylines are you looking for? Good question. I, I think, I mean, a lot of times it depends. Like an NBA regular season, especially with kind of where the Wizards are right now, realistically, you know, not exactly a, a playoff team. You know, it's just sort of like you go in probably with an idea. I, I have I want to write about uh, Rory Hachimura's adjustment to the NBA, Bradley Beal's leadership, why, why the Wizards are uh, struggling to, to defend, why are they making three-pointers, and try from there to, you know, watch for some anecdotes in the game that that would sort of lead to that but when they're good and especially when you get towards like the playoffs or something it becomes more about um individual matchups or you know how are they defending uh Kyrie Irving versus what are they doing offensively to try to free up Bradley Beal and uh you, you know I, I I, I, there are some people who are better, a lot better at, at film work than I am. I don't really try to, not necessarily an X's and O's guy, but you know, I have a pretty good feel for like uh, sort of the in the moment, what's happening in the game, what needs to be rotations or, or just some basic strategies to try to focus on things like that. That's great. So you're covering the Wizards. You know, there's, you know, this whole situation has kind of put, you know, the playoffs into jeopardy. But theoretically, this, you know, could help the Wizards in some way in terms of making the playoffs, right? Because there's talk of expanding the playoffs. What do you, have you heard about that? I don't know what they're going to do. I mean, I, I don't know if, the, I don't know if there's a way even in this scenario for the Wizards to, to make the playoffs. I mean, I think, look, and, and it, the, who knows what scenario they'll come up with. They could have four teams in the playoffs. They could decide we're going to have like an NCAA tournament style situation and everybody gets in. And anything would be, would be, would be possible. I guess at this point, I, I you know, realistically, the Wizards, um, you know, they're, they're probably not going. They're not going to make the playoffs in, in a traditional sense, but that's fine. Nobody was expecting it. They actually, on some level, performed a little bit better than people thought. For the most part this year, they were involved. They were uh, engaged. They were um, focused in games. If, you, if another team came in, they had to play hard to beat them. When some of these better teams came in and didn't give full effort. The Wizards took advantage of them. So, um, you know, I, I think you, you probably have to be overly 
pleasantly surprised with where they're at, but at the same point, there's still a long way to go before we're talking about them as like a real contender. Yeah. So you've um, you've covered a lot of teams, a lot of different games. What's you know the best game you've ever covered? Best best matchup. Oh boy. Um, probably. I think the, the most fun I had was the one year that Paul Pierce was playing with the Wizards. Mm-hmm. I, I am terrible at remembering years, um, but he uh, he played. It was the, you know for anybody who remembers, it was the I called game uh, playoffs where you know he made that shot and that he was just. I mean, it, it felt like it was covering like a living like a live a living legend. I mean, he'd obviously been a great player with the Celtics, was a Finals MVP. He's going to go to the Hall of Fame someday and he he was just so interesting to deal with he was um you, you know just the way he handled himself and just those shots he made uh, the 2014-15 season uh he um you know the i call game thing where he you know hits a bank he hits a, a bank shot at the buzzer to win a game and when asked you know Whoa, did you did you call glass he's like i called game at the end of that series the Wizards lost game six. He made a, a, a shot at the – he made a shot at the end that would have tied the game. It was literally like off the – you know, still touching his fingernails when the buzzer went off and, and they didn't. Um, yeah. And so it was just – his the way he enjoyed himself, his professionalism, but his, his level of clutch and, and cockiness, the whole thing was, was fantastic. And that's also when the Wizards were starting to ascend with John Wall and Bradley Beal and you kind of wondered, you know, where things could go. I, as somebody who, who grew up – you know, a fan of that team, you know, they've been in the desert forever and still are, I guess, in terms of being a real contender. Yeah. That, that was a rare time where you really had a feeling of like, wow, this is what the playoffs are like because uh, Pierce, but also like those other guys, uh, you know, started to rise up. Who were they playing in that series? I, I don't remember. I want to say that was the Atlanta Hawks. I, I my, 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 my brain is just terrible, but I'm pretty sure that was the Atlanta Hawks that year. Yeah. Um, and, uh, Wait, or no, was that the Pacers? Hold on, I'll figure it out. I think it might. Either the Hawks or the Pacers, I can't remember. Yeah, I remember going to one of those series. Um, I think it was the Pacers. It might have been the Pacers, because the Hawks was the one where John Wall broke his hand. Um, Yeah, 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 yeah. so so I think think that's what it was, actually, yeah, you're right. but yeah, that was uh, that was a so fun. So you've been in sports journalism for for a while. How have you seen sports journalism change over the years? Oh wow, uh, it's definitely changed a lot. Uh, I mentioned earlier the idea of the game story is sort of faded away. Just that itself, the very concept of like what is it, what is the people are looking to write uh, and and read. Um, you know, they they want more analysis. They want more behind the scenes. They don't necessarily want as much, you know, John Wall scored 27 points and the Wizards pulled away with a 16 to 4 run for a 108, 100 win over the over the Lakers and blah, blah, blah. Um, that, that in and of itself is a big thing. That also comes with uh, getting a little inside baseball, but that comes with sort of the model that sites use. And you're actually seeing this come into play now with this pandemic is that a lot of sites use the uh, effectively the click model. They, they need volume amount of people to go to their website, click on the story. That's how they get advertising. Sorry for every my eyes. That's how they get advertising. Um, and because of that, it tends also to lead to different types of stories. You're going to, you're going to do the story of, Hey, John Wall just put up an Instagram photo, photo of his new dog. I mean, it could be something as silly so, as so that. And that becomes journalism on some levels. You have a lot of sites that have cropped up over the years. SB Nation is an example of that. And they just effectively, are sort of sort of in trouble right now because without in our current situation with all the all money drying up, advertisers pulling back, that model is not working. One thing that's interesting about the athletic, I had a site that I started with two other colleagues uh, before we went. I went to NBC Sports Washington called the Sports Capital, which is like an R D C version area version of the athletic, where it's a subscription based. So you're not catering to this need of having to get. A volume amount of people to click on nonsense you can write in depth uh, what you think is interesting so I think that all, those things in and of itself I think are uh, are, are sort of a, a, a big deal I, I, I think also uh, there's um, 
so sort of to this point, because so many other sites sprung up trying to take advantage of that revenue model with, with ads, um, you know, it used to be sort of the old days of, you know, in terms of the local area here, you have the Washington Post, the Washington Times, the Associated Press and television and things like that. But then it became, you have these, oh, so many blogs and, and so on. And these blogs are not getting, they're, they're not hiring journalists. They're hiring young people like yourself, basically. Who are who? I, I don't know your background per se, but just in general, are not necessarily even if they're interested in doing this profession, they're not experienced, and a lot of them are not interested in doing profession at all. It's just a chance to be a looky loo and be at a, be in the locker room and at the court, and that has, and I think you can see this if you brought it out to the national journal, national media like news media, uh, it, it it changes like the dynamic of who's talking, and a lot of fans out there are not discerning to know the difference between sometimes. Somebody who's talking from the Athletic or the Washington Post versus somebody who has a credential, therefore looks official. But that, you know, to to the point before about like what I, you asked about the podcast, mm -hmm. the people who like the people who would do a podcast, but just to sort of oh Bradley Beal, he's so great, well, he's one of the best players. Like you know, like that 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 like that element becomes more involved, and um, it, it 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 gets tricky. I mean, like I said, you see this in the news too how to know which news sources to trust. I think teams teams in looking for as much coverage as they can get are, have opened the doors wider in a lot of cases. I don't think that's necessary. It's, it's, not, it, it, it's been okay in some spots. I don't think it's necessarily helped uh, broadly, though, because, again, it's harder to differentiate who's who for some people. But uh, I don't know. I could probably think of some other ones, but I guess those are a few things that have changed over the years. That's great. So you just mentioned your time at The Athletic. You know, you cover the Wizards and the Redskins. You know, how has that been so far? Um, you know what, I, uh, I, I'm a, I'm a Debbie Downer by nature and a half glass empty kind of guy, but I have to say that like at the athletic, you know, almost every day has been you know, really, re re really good. It's, it's, it's a, uh, you know, I, I don't know how interested into, or, you know, how, how deep you go with your knowledge of reporters and things like that. But if you just look at the roster of who's at the athletic, um, you know, Ken Rosenthal is like the preeminent baseball insider, uh, Shams Charania, I think I'm saying that right. You know, Tim and Woj are the ones battling out for NBA uh, on that. My, my boss is Dave, my direct boss is David Aldrich, a oh. basketball Hall of Famer who's in all the video games. Um, he, he was featured prominently in the Michael Jordan, that part one and part two of the documentary. And then there's, you know, the beat writers across the country and the various sports are often the best at what they do. So, you know, to, to be in that company and, and, and to, you know, to sort of see what they do and listen to them. Obviously, it's weird because uh, even the, Regardless of this pandemic situation, I would be working from home if I wasn't at a game. We don't have an office, so I, it's it's a different type of deal from that perspective. But you still, you know, we, we, there's ways we communicate, and uh, you know, I, I think the bosses as well. Like the, the vision of the site really appeals to me in terms of the revenue model, but that co that connects into the journalism and how we approach things and what we're allowed to do and what we can do and and and, and seek to do. So um, it, it's really interesting. I mean, I hope. I hope for all of our sakes that, you know, the journalism is taking a hit right now because of the um, situation. The sports is kind of a problem. Yeah. I don't know what's going to happen in time. I'm really hoping that, you know, for society's sake, things, you know, turn around quick. And for the purposes of what we're doing, I hope so, because I really think what we're doing makes a lot of sense. But it would help to have sport. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> I would go for just about any sports right now. Yeah, so. Yeah. You cover the Redskins as a football fan, a Redskins fan. I got to know, what do you think is coming from this team next year? Oh, boy. Um, <laughs> I um, – so as we're talking, you know, I'm going under the assumption they're going to take Chase Young with the second overall pick of the draft. I think from everything that everybody says about what he can bring as a player, adding him to a defense that already has some recent first-round picks and Montez Sweat, Jonathan Allen, Deron Payne, you still got Ryan Kerrigan, at least for this year, Landon Collins in the secondary. You know, there are some pieces in that defense, and then you add in uh, all new coaching staff. Ron Rivera is now the head coach for the defensive guy. They bring in Jack Del Rio, former head coach, two time head coach as the defensive coordinator. So, all those pieces together, I, I think, could be really interesting for that defense. The offense, <laughs> I mean, I, you know, we'll to, the draft will tell us a lot. They have to get more pieces. They have some, uh, you know, the, some picks that hopefully they can add a receiver or, or, or two to help Dwayne Haskins. But, you know, Dwayne Haskins played better the last two games of the season, but overall actually it was kind of a struggle for him. 
And, um, you know, I'm not going to sit here and say I'm 100% confident he'll, he'll become a, an established starter in this league. I'm not saying it's not possible. He has the skills to do it. But, you know, he's got to put in the work. He's got to gain more experience. And uh, we'll, we'll see. And obviously, everything, so much of what happens in the NFL comes down to the quarterback court. Yeah. So, you know, I think this year could be another, you know, sort of, even if they don't admit it, maybe something of a rebuild year, you know, figure out what you have with the roster. There's a lot of young guys, get more picks. And then go from there. But uh, yeah, I'm not expecting big, big momentum in year two on, or this year, unless Haskins makes a massive leap. Which you know, the fact that we have no idea. Forget the season. We we have no idea if they're going to be able to practice in any real way this year. Uh, certainly, no. They're already canceling OTAs and mini camps. Yeah. Training camp isn't until you know late July. But I wouldn't sit here right now and predict that. So for that, those things. Let's just even say they start playing. It, regular season normally that's rough for a guy like Dwayne Haskins he really needs to put in reps you know with his teammates with the coaches to to get as you know, good a feel as he can and that that's a potential hindrance but that yeah so much if we're going to say what are the Redskins at this year because we're going to come down to you know as often the case the quarterback that's great I love that analysis right there so what would you say are the qualities of a good writer Oh, boy. Uh, good question. You know, I mean, I think everybody – one thing that's interesting when you read, like, The Athletic or really just read any 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 different writers on any given beat, everybody kind of comes at it in different ways. Some people just write great prose. They can really string together sentences and, and come up with great words um, to, to, to really, you know, make a point and, or, or, or describe a scene. Uh, other people have, you know, great um, – great with the analysis you know they, they can really explain what what just happened in a way that, that people can connect to um you know other people it's not necessarily writing but in terms of like reporting you know be dogged you know figure out contact everybody you can think of uh you know do it in a in a, in a in not in a haphazard way but in a way that's productive uh, so all these things i think it just depends on the person i think some people are, are sort of more connected to their emotions as it were, and that can come out in their writing. Other people maybe are a little more reserved and, the, and it holds them back on a certain level, but maybe they have strengths in some of these other ways. So, you know, ultimately I just think, you know, as cliche as it is, work hard, be observant, especially as a writer, not just in terms of what's happening on the court, but just around you. Um, and look, what other other journalists are doing? I think probably one of the biggest things that's helped me out through this process is, uh, being, I immerse myself as much as I could in these various beats. I would go to like wizard practices or when they, like during the draft and they would have, um, uh, bring in prospects to, to do workouts. Uh, if I was, even if I wasn't getting paid, I just showed up. I was around, I hung around. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I was in the mix. I was talking to the other writers, even if it was just talking about the wizards, but, you know, just to get a feel for what, what goes on, what, you know, what other people, See, it's one thing to talk to my dopey friends all the time, but they're just like the regular fans. They're viewing it a certain way, and that's totally reasonable for what they're doing. But this other thing is something else. And not that everybody, trust me, not everybody who, who's a sports writer does view the view sports on a higher plane that I'm trying to get to. Some of them are <laughs> not, not, not that impressive when it comes to the analysis, in my opinion. But, you know, you, you get behind the scenes. You, you, you know, you start learning, you're meeting the PR people, you, you know, the more you're around, the more they recognize you. And that's in terms of, you know, a different type of question about like, you know, like how do people just wonder like, how do you get sources and things like that? Um, you got to be around you, and you got to, you got to, you got to talk to people, but you have to be around. You have to, they have to see you. And then once that start, starts happening and they see you as a person and somebody who isn't just here for, for a day, but you're actually putting in the work. And then eventually I think over time, you know, they, they respect that and start, you know, talking to you in, in, in various ways. You know, maybe they're not going to tell you about who they're going to pick in the, in the draft. But, you know, you, you, you make some moves, you, you go from there. And, you know, and, that, and that's especially if you're doing what I'm trying to do, you know, that's obviously a, a big help. That's great. So what would you say is the best, you know, writing advice you've ever got? Um... You know, I don't know if I got this, but I was just yesterday writing a story on uh, Trayvon Diggs. He's the cornerback uh, from Alabama, potential first-round pick, younger brother of Stephon Diggs, and uh, they you know, they grew up in the in this general area, in the DC area. 
So I was able to get Trayvon and do a story about him. And I wasn't quite sure where I was going. I figured his brother would be involved in some way, especially because it's, you know, got traded away from Minnesota to Buffalo this off season. And there was some drama there, but also when Stefan Diggs was going through the draft five years ago, he was, you know, thought to be, you know, maybe a, a round two, round three guy. He slipped to the fifth round and it was like, Oh boy, you know, that's got to stink. And Trayvon is there. So I was kind of curious, what did he see? What does he remember from that? And then I also talked to the mother, um, about that and you know she was a nervous wreck then it is again but with all that I could not figure out what my story I couldn't figure out what my angle was I couldn't figure out what the top of my story was and that pretty much paralyzed me for a while yesterday I just could not I I just couldn't figure out what to do and eventually I just got to a point where and I think this is sort of the point is at some point you just have to start writing something uh, you, you just have to figure out everybody has their own some people write the first word go straight down to the last word. I, I'm not necessarily that guy. I might try to do that, but sometimes I'll go here, I'll get to here. I'm like, oh, well, you know what? This should be over here and I'll go back and everybody has their own system and mine is definitely not perfect, but just at a very basic level, write the story. It doesn't matter how crappy it is. Nobody's seeing it now except for you. Just put down, just get in the flow of whatever this thing is. And then from that, hopefully you will figure out you will get into a rhythm. You'll get connected to this story that you're trying because you want the other people to get connected to it. So if you don't get connected to it, then they're not going to get it. So you figure out as you're going through, what's this thing that, that I find interesting? And then hopefully when I, I wouldn't call it writer's block, that's a little too extreme, but just if you file stuck, just, just, just do it. It's almost like when, you know, it's like going to the gym on some level, nobody wants to do it for the most part, but just, just go, just get to the gym and just do it. Once you start, you'll be fine. It's the starting that's the problem. It's kind of the same principle. You just have to start. And then once you do that, you can hopefully figure out uh, a path to, to get where you want to go. That's great. I love that analogy too. So I got one last question for you. For people who aspire to be sports journalists, such as yourself, what advice would you give to you know a 15-year-old who you know, wants to be a sports journalist? Uh, don't do it. Go go become a lawyer. Or, <laughs> or, or maybe not a lawyer. Go, go save the planet. I don't know. Um, the, the, the reality is, like, I don't want to scare anybody off. The reality is, you know, journalism's in a rough spot right now. I mean, forget the pandemic situation, because obviously that's kind of messing up everybody, but it does expose the problem. And the problem is people are struggling to make money off it. Uh, the newspaper industry made a big mistake when the internet came out because they opened it up to the world. They didn't charge off the bat to read the stuff online, even though you had to buy the physical paper. Um, from that, they've never really quite caught up, and, and, and the revenue is a problem. And that's why, even before this, a lot of newspapers that used to have, you know, have 200 employees are down to a bare bones staff, and why um, you know, some established reporters get bought out and they bring in a, you know, a, a younger person who costs less money because it is about the bottom line. Don't let me, I'm not trying to scare anybody off. But my, my point is that it's a very, it, it's a tough industry just from that perspective. That's why I've, um, I was, um, myself and two of my colleagues, we started the sports capital um, two years ago at this point, time flies. For me, it was, I was tired of doing freelance constantly. I could not get anybody to just simply want to hire me full time for all kinds of reasons, including th there was no money out there or they would just, you know, because I'm an older, older guy relative to a 22 year old out of college, they would just, well, we'll just go down that route. They have no expectations, so we'll go down that route. And we started this site because we're like, I was like, screw it. Let's, let's just do our own thing. We'll, tire, we'll call the shots. And that really was, that was overall probably the most fun I've had in this job because we got, we had to make all the rules. It, it lived or died with us. And I don't want it, but, but the problem is how do you make money doing that? It, you know, that's not easy. You have to be your own brand to make that work. So uh, all that said, sports is, covering sports is not real work. This is a lot of fun. Um, you know, there is no rooting in the press box. So if you think it's about, you know, you get it close for the action so you can root on the Redskins or the Nats or whatever, like that's not a thing. But if you want to, you know, if you're interested in sports, if you, if you like for me, if you view it on a higher level that, you, you know, it isn't just, well, they scored the most points, therefore they won. You're looking at the other things. What is happening? Do you feel some sort of connection to it? I, it's obviously a fantastic situation to go into. But uh, it is, uh, you know, it, it, don't don't expect, you know, massive paydays. Uh, you know, the hours are weird. I mean, I never know what day of the week it is anymore. Not because of the coronavirus situation. I never, I, just in general, because you work weekends, you work nights, 
all the time. Like there's no real day off during the season. Um, but it's a lot of fun. You're, you're, you know, you're in a, it's a celebrity situation on some level, depending on the team and, and the moment. And, uh, you know, it, it, it really is, you know, you're, you're where everybody wants to be, you know, when you're at that, when you're at that big game and the Wizards are playing LeBron James and it's a sold out house and everybody wants to see LeBron, you're there. And, you know, you're, you're in the locker rooms afterwards and, you know, you're the one who's going to tell everybody, here's what I saw, here's what I heard, here's what I think. And, uh, you know, uh, it, from that perspective, you know, it's, it's, I, I, you know, there's nothing else I'd rather be doing. That's great. I really appreciate your words of honesty on the, on the profession. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for speaking with me. Uh, thank you so much.